Thank you very much. Welcome to another episode of Chase Jarvis Live. Thank you, Internet, for tuning in live. Very, very excited to have everyone here in the studio and the thousands of folks who are watching at home. Uh, amazing episode today. We're calling it the No BS Business episode of Chase Jarvis Live because we have one of the world's foremost, the person who's inspired me more in the business of art and photography than any other person in the world, Ramit Sethi, with us today. And it's going to be an amazing show. Um, throw out the ramen. No more starving artist mentality. That is old news. Before we bring him out, I got a couple of uh, housekeeping issues. First, I want to thank Polaroid and B&H for supporting the show. Huge, huge support. Thank you. Couldn't do it without you. Also, I got to give a shout out. We had a contest going to retweet the blog post over the last couple days. And the winner of those signed book, this here book, which is Ramit's book, I Will Teach You To Be Rich, two of those signed and autographed to you personally are Kern Photo and Sweet House. Proper respect to you for promoting the show. Thank you very much. And there's a new uh, contest that starts right now. We'll go on the rest of the show. If you folks at home hear something you like, a quote, retweet that, the hashtag CJ Live, the URL to the show to win a signed book. And if you include at Polaroid, you'll be eligible to win the Polaroid that I shoot, a one of a kind Polaroid of every guest for the show, and you'll be able to win that. Hopefully worth a ton of money at some point in the future. So. Without further ado, we're going to get down to brass tacks because I promised a hard-hitting show, a no bullshit, cut straight to the truth with Ramit Sethi. Please join me in welcoming him. He's right here. Come on up, buddy. Where are you at? Yeah. Uh, Thanks for having me. Thank you. All right. There's your cocktail Thank slash you. orange juice. Slash. Good for slash you. how many times will they refill that? As many as show. you want. As many as you want. <laughs> Okay, so I had made some big promises. I don't know if you heard about this uh, in, my, in the internets, in the tubes. I promised to eat my shorts if people did not walk away from this show with some skills and some information, some knowledge that they didn't have before the show. Love it. So my shorts are not tasty, <laughs> and that means I need you to deliver the goods. All right. Um, we all know, let's, let's settle in for just a second here, because we all know, if I may, uh, tell a little story about artists and creatives. We tend to have problems selling ourselves. Yeah. And I think there's a belief out there that because I can be on live television with how many thousands of people watching that I don't have that same problem. Not true. I think we all have it because we're out there talking about ourselves and not just ourselves, but our work. Right. And you have to be able to talk about your work and you have to be able to talk about yourself. But more than anything, you have to have a knowledge of what it is the other person wants to hear. Yep. So before we get into the specifics and the nitty gritty, tell me a little bit about your background, where you came from, what you're doing here. Give me, yeah. the, give me the lowdown. Well, you know, my, my background is uh, basically got very interested in how people behave. Why do they do what they do? So for example, we all know that we should work out more, eat less, what are you, saying you know, manage our money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is a veiled comment <laughs> direct. And, but yeah, we don't do it, right? right? So we all know we should do these things, so why don't we? And I got tired of reading the same old advice, you know, keep a budget, don't spend money on lattes. That stuff sounds like it would be logical, but it just doesn't work. Right. So I got very interested in this. My background is in social influence and persuasion. And so I started learning how people work. Mm. How do you change other people's behavior? How do, you change, how do I change my own behavior? And so I created all these little tests and systems to go to the gym more, to automate my money. And over time, I started noticing these really funny things. You know, I'm Indian, and I think Indian people are basically bred to negotiate. So since I've been a little kid, my parents have been like, look, this is how you negotiate when you go to Macy's. This is who, talk to her, don't talk to her. She's too smart. Make sure you say this. And I learned how to bargain with all these people. I didn't know you could negotiate with Macy's. Most people don't. <laughs> you shouldn't be able to, but you can. Wow. And so I started learning how to negotiate everything in terms of the phrases and in terms of the mindset, right? It's mm -hmm. not, people think negotiations is this adversarial thing. Hey, Chase, I'm gonna take all your money. Like, yeah, I won. No, it's not. It can be cooperative. And if you do the job right, that the other person actually wants to pay you. They want to work with you. And price almost becomes a triviality. So I learned these things. I studied it in school on a theoretical basis. I got more applied, launched my book. And basically now my can science I, Can just, I talk about your education for a second? Yeah. Stanford educated, Harvard, or Oxford educated. 
And so you do, you, you did go to some finer learning institutions, right? Yeah. Is that where you learned the meat of the matter, or did you learn in the streets? Like, what's the? Uh, that's both, actually. So learning it when I was a kid was through my parents, learning very applied, right? What do you say? Who do you talk to? And then learning the real theoretical models in school. And I think there's power to both. So it's easy to write a top 10 list of things to say in a negotiation. But I really appreciate people who have that theoretical rigor. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about all those things today. Got it. And then, you know, how do you apply that to money? to business, to personal relationships. You can apply all these things to many different parts of life. All right, I'm gonna tell a short story, and you tell me if I put my foot in my mouth or I blow it anyway. All right. So um, the person introduced us as Tim Ferriss. Tim is a good friend, and he's been on the show before. Tim, if you're watching, respect. Um, and it was at a gathering that Tim was having, and I don't know, you and I started visiting. And as I said in my blog post, uh, I learned more in 30 minutes talking to you than I had in the previous 10 years. And the things that stuck with me the most, the absolute most, were how the negotiation or the idea of, in our case, talking about art and creativity was very much about understanding the mindset of the, the other. Yeah. And as soon as you take it out of the adversarial thing, and it's like, if I can create and illustrate the value that I'm bringing in the right way, that not only would this person like be an advocate, but they will actually be happy to give you not just some money, but more money than you thought you could, you totally. could do the job for. Totally, it's, it's all about understanding the other person, and that's really hard to do. We're not built naturally to understand the other person. We walk into an interview or to a client meeting and all we want to talk about is here's what I can do. I, I, I. We call it I, I, I syndrome. And so it takes really hard work to be able to understand the other person. I'll give you an example. We built this course on earning money and we spent over one year and collected over a hundred thousand data points to understand why people want to earn money, why are they already not earning money, all these barriers. So for example, why do you think the number one reason people want to earn money on the side is like these are 20s and 30s. Why do you think they want to earn an extra thousand dollars a month? What would they do with it? Oh, man, I don't know, vacation? That's what I thought. I thought they're going to go to Vegas and basically ball it up, bottle service, and just like staying at the best places. Right. I was sure. Wrong. I was totally wrong. It was people want to have the option to eventually quit their jobs. Not to quit, but to have the option. So when we learned that, it totally changed the way we framed it. Ah. And so when we're writing our marketing and when we're writing about the course, people are reading it and they actually say, holy shit, I can't believe this guy just said that. I was actually gonna say those words right now. So it almost to them seems like we're reading their minds. Got it. But that's because we did all the work beforehand. Yeah, and that's thank you for doing all the work because that's the work that you've already done in the ten years of your career is what we're hoping to pour out on the stage here and into the audience and into the audience at home. Um, so, I mean, where, where do we where, where do we start? Like, what what's the when you stand back and you look at creatives and their inability, their total ineptitude at, <laughs> it's embarrassing it's why it's we live up to the stereotypes it's you know and everyone in the audience is looking sheepishly at me, me right now um, i wish you folks at home could see that but we're all guilty of it and i hate it as much as the next person and is it is it about representing and we in my blog post i said we're going to talk about some specific things we're going to talk about negotiating mm -hmm. 80 percent of the negotiation is done before you ever sit set foot in the room or get on the phone. That's right. right? 80%. That mm -hmm. to me was a mind blower. That was one of the things that you told me before. So we better learn about that. Yeah. We better learn about how to create val how, how to illustrate the value that you bring to the client. Yep. And one of the other things I love, I think in your world that's called the briefcase. Uh, briefcase technique. The briefcase technique. Yeah. Um, in our world, it would be the portfolio technique. This shit is going to blow your mind. Yeah. So those are a couple of things yeah. that we want to cover. We also want to be taking questions the whole time from folks here in the live studio audience and those folks at home. So as a reminder, if you want to ask a question while you're tweeting away these brilliant things, these nuggets that Ramit's dropping so you can win two copies of his signed book, which we should grab the book here real quick. Oh, yeah. um, I will teach you to be rich. So while you're retweeting clever quotes, um, the hashtag CJ Live and the URL to this live page to win signed books, also be thinking about questions because I'm going to be going to the phones as, yep. as much as possible. We are going to be going to the phones you can go to the phones by at Chase Jarvis, at Ramit, mm -hmm. R-A-M-I-T, hashtag CJ Live. And we'll be picking up those questions periodically throughout the course of the show. So do that. We will try and get to as many questions. Again, this is a no bullshit, straight ahead, answer your questions show. 
No, I mean, theory is nice, but we're going to get to the meat. Right. Okay. Um, so this is, while we got you here, why don't you tell me about this for a second? Uh, well, I almost committed suicide 25 times writing this book for two years. So it's hard, it's hard writing it, but the reason I wrote it was people would come to me and they'd be like, hey, what credit card should I use? Or I have $5,000 sitting in my savings account. What should I do with it? Or I can't, like I make a lot of money or I make a decent amount of money, but I have nothing left at the end. And the funny thing is, and this is getting inside people's minds, think about most money books. The first thing you do, you pick them up and- I, I think they're cheesy, first of all. Like they freak yeah. me out from afar. I'm like- Because there's a guy sitting oh, on it like this. Like, yeah. Yeah, look at my suit. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, oh God, <laughs> stop it. In your oversized suit. So the, these books, the first thing they do, the first chapter is they're like, Let's, let's write down how much you spend everywhere. And you know what people are like? They're like, mm, fuck this. Mm -hmm. No one wants to do that. <laughs> Who wants to write how much they spend? It's like a terrible feeling. Right. So what I, what I did was, this is all about the psychology, right? I started with credit cards. We all have credit cards. We all hate our credit cards. And we could all negotiate our credit cards with one phone call and usually save hundreds of dollars a month. And I actually gave the scripts that you can read off the phone and just like melt them like butter. So yeah, it's cool and I'm glad people get started. But the point of that is, when you do a book or when you walk into a client meeting, what is it that people want and what do they not want? What are their hopes, fears, and dreams? So you, if you, you tell me. Yeah, let's, right let's, let's talk about the barriers for artists. Okay. What, why, why are creatives generally so terrible at representing themselves? Well, mostly because I think they're introverted and they're all about their art and they're, I would say that's a, a big portion of it, but the number one is that there's some sort of there's a patronizing underpinning to making money. Like uh -huh. if you somehow make money, then you've sold out right. and you're, you're bullshit. Right. And I, for one, have fought the, the difference between fine art and commercial art for a long time. I see them as very fused. We've been getting commissions for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. But I think that's the, mo the biggest problem is if you're, if you're killing it, then you're, you're somehow not sweet and you've sold, yeah. sold out. And, and it happens when your peer group is around you. They're looking at you and they're like, you're a sellout. Or you're seeing these other magazines and people are writing comments on the blog posts like, this guy's a sellout. His stuff is not pure anymore. So there's that. I think there's a few other reasons too. Okay. Um, one is uh, an over-focus on the craft. Now the craft matters, no doubt about it. You have to be good, you have to be very good right. or even better. But it's easy to get comfortable doing what we know. So for example, if I can write really good blog posts, I could do that all day long. But is that gonna grow my business to where I want it to go? And I see like a lot of my creative friends, they're like, oh, I really need to get this new camera. Or I really need to spend another two years on this one piece of pixel perfection. What they, but really does the client understand that? Does the average client that they're going after understand it? Maybe at your level, but for most of no, us. No, no, actually at my level it's further, like they assume ah. that, that like you have the technical, that all that's just, if you showed up and didn't have that, yeah. it's like, you know, there's 50 people sitting there like, who the fuck hired this guy? Right. And right. so it's assumed that you're, that you have all that. And the way I, I talk about it often is professional golf. Like, you don't get to be on the PGA for being sort of good. Right. You have to be able to hit the ball down the middle of the fairway if it's raining, right. if there's 100 people watching or 10 million people watching, yeah. it doesn't matter, that's assumed. So I think we can just for sake of this conversation and for the folks at home that you can execute technically. So yes, just, yes. let's just take that right. off the table because if you don't, you need to keep practicing. Exactly. So, so let me give you an example of one of my students. This is one of my favorite examples. So I had this student of mine, her name is Jackie. She lives in Minneapolis. She's like, I believe she's in her late 20s, just like this ordinary girl and she's a violin instructor. Okay. And she came to me and she's like, I want to learn how to earn more using my skills. And so, okay, she could have spent the next 20 years becoming absolutely perfect at violin. A but virtuoso. she was already a virtuoso. Right. She was already very good. And so we said, all right, let's look at the business. And so she started talking about who she's serving. Now, when you think about a violin instructor, who really is their customer? She was teaching kids, but kids cannot be your customer. They don't have any money. All right? And I'll teach a framework about how to think about who your customer is. So she starts looking and we start analyzing it. And it turned out that her real customer was basically Asian and Jewish parents, actually Asian and Jewish mothers. So why do you think that is? They have money. They have the ability to pay and the willingness to pay. We call that the pay certainty technique. So if you're thinking about like, who am I actually serving? The pay certainty technique. Do they have the ability to pay and do they have the willingness to pay? So she. So in the, in the art world, this would, be, this would be your photo editor or your art, art 
buyer, your producer, the the art director. Like they technically are the ones who hire you. Someone else writes the check, but those that's your customer. Got it. Specifically. Okay. Perfect. So then so then we helped her go deeper. So you can't just put a flyer together that says, you know, violin instruction, come here, fifty dollars an hour. We we taught her how to understand what is it that these mothers actually want. So they're mothers of kids. Now, yes, they want their kids to learn violin, but why? Let's go further, why? And so it turned out that they wanted them to become really good at this because there's a heritage value of violin, but what they really wanted is for their son or daughter to get into Harvard. That's what they wanted, believe it or not. So that totally reframed the way she positioned it. Okay. Her flyers now say, little Timmy used to be so introverted, now he's so extroverted, and I think he's gonna get an amazing education. So a mother reads that and she's like, oh my God, they read my mind. She earned in eight weeks, $81,000 doing violin instruction. So she could have spent 20 years. I'm in the wrong line of business. <laughs> <laughs> but she could have spent so much time focusing on the craft or just like putting it out there, getting on Twitter, doing all this stuff. And that all matters. You have to do some of that. Right. But let's understand the person we're Okay, so let's, let's take that no bullshit approach to photographers and, and directors and yeah. whatnot in the creative class here. So how do, they, how do they take that same step with the clients that I just mentioned, the photo editors, the art directors, and whatnot? So let's talk about what do these photo editors want and what do they fear? Too many people skip over those two okay. things. The number one thing that they want is they want to be recognized by their peers within the magazine or within their agency for finding the next badass creative who's doing cool stuff. Good. And their fear is, and anyone at home or y'all in the audience can correct me, but I think having been doing this for a decade plus, I, I figured it out. And their fear is blowing it, like mm -hmm. bringing in someone who's unqualified, who hasn't the ability to do this work before. Right. Or hasn't, right. Hasn't, hasn't, doesn't have the ability and hasn't done this sort of level of work before. They, they're risk averse yep. because usually that means if I blow this half million dollar campaign, my ass is out the door. Mm -hmm. Because what they're really ba banking on when they bank on a photographer on a big campaign is, look at, we're putting the $300,000 production budget plus the ad buy behind this. Yep. So a lot of money, a lot of zeros. So th those are their fears. Yep. And often the ability to hire the best, like the most, the perfect person is undermined by the fear factor of like, oh man, well, I'd sure like to hire that new renegade creative over there, but this dude's done it a hundred times, so, you know, and somewhere in the middle is, is perfection, I yep. feel like. Renegade, old timer, somewhere in there is the sweet spot. So think about how most photographers go about addressing these concerns. First of all, they don't even think about them. They just walk in and they're like, me, me, me. They walk in with their portfolio and they just put it down on the table and they say, there you go. You make the decision. As if this person is supposed to understand all the intricacies about why you're qualified. Mistake number one is expecting the other person to recognize your brilliance without you even communicating it. The next thing, can we yeah. can we linger on that for a second? Expecting the other person, it, so it's it's almost it's ignorant to expect the other person to recognize your brilliance without even communicating. You need to teach them to revere what you've done. So, for example, when I give away free material to my audience, and 98% of my stuff is free, not only do I give it to them for free but I teach them why they need to revere it. So I'll say, for example, look guys, this webcast I did with one of my mentors, a professor from Stanford, I'm, I'm giving it to you for free, but I wanna tell you, I spent 16 hours preparing for- Hang on just a second, Chase Jarvis Live is free, <laughs> but I wanna tell you that I spent 10 years cultivating all of the blah, 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 never mind. Just... I tell them that, no, right. it's, it's, you know what? People, when they learn what you did behind the scenes to prepare and all this preparation, you've done all these people you've brought in your crew, they appreciate you even more. When you go in to meet a client, you don't just put down your portfolio. You say, let me explain for just 60 seconds if you don't mind, some of the thought that went into this. And you explain why they should revere you and what makes you different. So that's kind of number one. Don't okay. expect them to recognize your brilliance. So, ex like, I think we should say that again. Explain to them what went into creating the work. Yeah and why it's different. Absolutely. Why it's unique. Yep. And in the world of art, ladies and gentlemen, we remember from last Chase Jarvis Live where we had Allegra Wild talking about portfolios. You don't try to be better, you try and be different. Don't try and be better, try and be different. And when you take that 60 seconds to explain and tell a story, yep. great book by, I think is it Peter Gruber? Yeah, tell to story, win. yeah. Tell to Win, amazing, amazing book about telling a story. So you tell a story about what you went through to create this work and why it's different than what's out there. Yep. Got it. Number two, and that 
dovetails perfectly. They try to appeal to everybody. Huge mistake. This is like classic rookie mistake. It, it's, they, they believe that I just need to appeal to everyone. I shoot cats and I shoot houses and I shoot exactly. weddings and I shoot exactly. advertising and food and I shoot all that stuff. Hire me. Hire me. Pre let's, let's just do a scenario. Okay. Let's pretend that I'm- Is this I'm, a role play? Because I'm It is, excited. are you ready? Yeah, I'm getting And I'm going to be the woman in this. All right. Oh. I'm a new mother. Okay. This is a perfect role for me. I just, it, it adapts very <laughs> you got well. The, you got the cardigan, I love <laughs> yeah. it. So I'm a new mother and I want a picture of my newborn son. And I just got home, it's two, three days after I gave birth. Who do I want to hire? I have two choices of photographers. Okay. Do I want to hire John Doe, who does photos of horses, barns, kids, adults, and buildings? Or do I want to hire Richard Millinghouse, who photographs babies between the ages of two weeks and three months? Enough said. Clear, right? And by the way, does price matter? At that point, when you're talking about photographing your one and only child that you just gave birth to, yeah. it is probably a, like when you say literally it doesn't matter, it's probably, it becomes way less important yes. than you think it is. Yes, absolutely. So that is so important with photographers and anyone in the creative field. A lot of times we obsess about price. Well, how can I charge that much? Like this guy's over here charging $10 a photo. How can I expect to charge $100 an hour or $10,000 a project? When you can really hit on what they want, what they hope, fear, and dream, price becomes almost a mere triviality. And it's amazing. Mr. Richard Millinghouse could come in and say, look, um, there are plenty of other photographers out there. In fact, I'm happy to recommend some if you like. I happen to be the only one who focuses on it. By the way, here are some of my photos that I've done, and here's why they're different from some of the stuff you'll find. So notice I haven't been adversarial. I've been super friendly, and price is like a distant fifth. It's, it's vaporizing right yeah, now. It's absolutely, right? You can feel it. I do. So, I want to buy your baby photos. <laughs> my baby photos, yeah. <laughs> Let me sell you some photography, Chase. That would be my ultimate accomplishment. Okay. Um, so all of these things kind of combine when it comes to, to photographers and other creative folks that we think we, let's just appeal to everyone. And it's almost counterintuitive, but the narrower you go, especially when you're starting off, the more that that specific person will pay essentially anything to get what you want. Um, and I'll just finish with one final thing. The craft is important, no doubt, but like you have to understand what your clients want. For example, I have a video crew and I have some designers on staff that work with me. Now, are there people that are probably technically more skilled? Of course, there's always somebody. Mm -hmm. However, that's why I advocate not trying to be better, but being yes. different, okay? And, and they, are, they are different, indeed, because they know that what I value is when I send an email, I want a response within one hour. That's just how I want my business to run. They know that they need to over communicate with me. So for me, communication matters way more than getting this perfect shading or perfect color. Like it's gonna be good, no doubt about that. But I would rather have someone that for my business serves me in the way that I want. So someone could come to me and if they didn't read me right, they would say, look at these 50 photos. I use this type of film and I use this type of lighting and I'm just like, I don't care. Show me testimonials of how you've communicated well with other people. When you do that, price is out the door. You're focusing on what I want. What I want, not you. Right. What I, the client, wants. And price is just a trivial. So, so at that point, what we have to agree to, if I'm not mistaken, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you have to do something to get inside the head of the person who's trying to hire you yeah. because you have to understand what they want. Right? Yeah. And, and you can make guesses and you can be wrong, but by and large, I think specifically within the photo industry, the people that hire you, whether you're a wedding shooter and it's a bride, or whether as I, you know, I, it's a photo editor or something, mm -hmm. um, like are there steps that you can take? Like, should you be doing research? Yeah. Like, what, what, like how do you understand, how do you advocate us understanding our clients? Okay, the research is the secret sauce. This is what separates the people who can charge 100 times what other people can, and honestly can just get cool projects versus the other people who will scrape by for the rest of their lives. And that'll complain about the man, and if only I had that, then I could get these clients. So let me show you some examples of research. Um, let's say that you're a wedding photographer, and you've decided to get into this space, and, and you, you have some photos under your belt, maybe you've done it informally and free for some friends. So what would be a good way of doing it? First, I would wanna just start off by saying, who am I trying to target? I'm not trying to target every person. Every person is getting married. Yeah, that's, a, that's gonna be a tough one. Right. First of all, my customer is, the bride, okay? It's certainly not the groom, it's the bride. Let's just be specific. And by the way, I'm making stereotypes right now, that's okay. It's okay to start off with broad stereotypes and then you test them. Okay. So we do this, we call it the five minute straight jacket technique. We turn off our phone, 
turn off our computers, we basically just close our eyes and we think, what is this bride's experience right now? She's three months from the wedding, she's feeling X, Y, Z, she's got this to-do list that's not getting, everything's getting added to it, and she wants to get these beautiful photos. Why? Why does she want these photos? She wants to show off, she wants to show it to her friends, she wants to have a memory, and what does she not want? She doesn't want a photographer who's gonna show up late, who's gonna do a horrible job, blah, blah, blah. So we just visualize this, we stereotype, we write it's it down. It's amazing how simple this is. Yeah. Like, how many in the audience, show of hands, have done this? Have closed your eyes and thought, what do the people that want to hire me actually want? Show of hands. Five of 30. Yeah. Five of 30, okay. Okay, so we do this thing, we're sitting here, closed eyes, straight jacket technique, but then we need to take it another step. Okay. okay. We have these stereotypes, these ideas. Let's go test them. So what I tell people is turn off your computer, get out of your stupid room, go talk to the market. So what I would do is find women who were just married, recently uh, married brides. And I would say, do you mind if I just take you out to coffee for 15 minutes? I'm trying to get into this. I'm doing a little homework, not trying to sell you anything. Just curious about your experience and I would really appreciate your time. So if you, if you send an email like that, especially through this a warm so friend. so simple. Yeah, it's no secrets. So simple, okay. Send, send an email. Out of 10 emails you send, you will get at least three meetings. Okay. That's a pretty good response rate. So I take them out and I'm just saying, tell me about your experience with the wedding. I just start off really broadly. And re-emphasize, I'm not trying to sell anything. And then ask them like, how did you choose your photographer? Were you happy? What would you have changed? If price was no object, what would you have wanted? And then ask them about their feelings. How did they feel when they chose the photographer? Why did they choose this over that? Now you do this with five to 10 people and you start to hear words. So for example, you're, you'll hear words like, um, you know, I wasn't sure but my friend used him and he was really good. She was really happy with him. Okay, that's a really important thing. Or I loved how when he showed up, he brought me a cup of coffee that morning. It showed that he was thoughtful. Okay, so that's a check mark, I'm writing that down. All of a sudden now, you're learning what actual customers have said, guess what you do? Just like with Jackie, you go back and in your marketing material, you put that in there. Now when you go to your potential clients, they're like, oh my God, he read my mind. mind. <laughs> How did he do that? Got it. Well, he did it because he did the hard work. Well, that's a great, like, again, I'm gonna reference last week's Chase Jarvis Live with Allegra. She's saying, like, again, it's the technical, you get in the door with being a decent photographer, but when you're, when, when you're in the sphere of being a great photographer, that's when you try, that, that's when the cream rises to the top, right. and it's, it is, who do I, I gotta go to Barbados for two weeks with this dude. Who do I wanna hang out with for two weeks? I see him at six in the morning and I see him at 10 at night all day, every day for yep. 20 days or 15 days. Who do you want to be with? Mm -hmm. And so things like what kind of music you like, what kind of person you are, having a blog or some sort of social thing where you're putting out the things that you are and aren't. And you shouldn't be trying to fool these people, exactly. right? Yeah. Talk it's, about that for so, a second. Okay, it's so important to disqualify. So think about this. Let's just take it to men and women and attraction. I love this because there's so many I analogies. Love this too. I love it. Okay. <laughs> so, let's dim the lights, please. Yes, please. Um, so, if I go to a bar and I'm like, "Please, please, please talk to me. Please go on a date with me. Please, 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 please." please. How do you think women react? They're just like, "Yeah." You know, they don't. However, if I, I walk in, I'm confident, I'm with my buddies, having a drink, and, you know, I'm just like a, a confident guy that doesn't need anything that night the perception is totally different. Now the same thing is true when you go talk to clients. I'm not walking in begging when I put my portfolio down. I'm saying, look, I don't, I'm not right for everybody. For the few people that I'm right for, I do an extraordinary job. But I'm, gonna, I'm here to help figure out what you want. That's, both those are so quotable, it makes me smile. Like, I'm here for, the, for what I do, I can deliver an extraordinary product. I can deliver extraordinary art. Mm -hmm. That to me, and even just saying those yes. words, isn't it rare? It's I, I've I've been in a thousand of these meetings. I've personally, you know, with me as the as the artist, but I've also been a part of other meetings where artists are coming in and presenting. And yeah. those words never get said. No, because no, it 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 almost is like it seems like you have to be arrogant to say it. But just let's let's listen to the way that I say it again. Like, you know, I can do an extraordinary job, not for everybody, but for the few people that I want to work with and that want to work with me. Nothing about that was arrogant. I'm just being very matter of fact. And so you don't have to come in like, yeah, I'm the best. That's not, that's not how you're yeah, walking in. You're but you're being confident about what you're good at. Yeah, I've also seen a lot of people you know, behave like D-bags. And, <laughs> you know, and that's not cool either, no, right? And, no. and, but there is a way to be confident and, and 
assertive without being presumptuous, without being a d bag, without being over, you know, without being cocky. And it's it's I think accepting yes. that you aren't for everybody. Like right. we, again, I'm gonna the third time already refer back to yesterday or last week's episode. Like hey, look at I think you need to get hired by ten to twenty. Uh, folks in my line of work at mm -hmm. least uh, you know wedding photographers might be a little bit different uh, studio portfolio uh, uh, headshot photographers could be different but I need to shoot you know if I shoot 10 to 20 campaigns a year it's an amazing year yeah and like, you don't have to appeal to everybody as right. soon as you start trying to appeal to everybody you appeal to nobody so actually putting that on the table yeah in the conversation, that's what you're advocating. That's right? what I do with my own business as well. So for example, I tell people, if you uh, have credit card debt, you're not allowed to buy my flagship course. You're not allowed to, I don't allow you to. And if I find out, I'll refund your money and I'll ban you from any course ever again. And people are like, what the fuck? Who does that? And Who doesn't yet, want to take money from me? Who doesn't want to take a lot of money from me? And yet, what does it do for me and my business? Yeah, it costs me a lot in the short term, but people know this guy isn't just here to make a bunch of money from me right up front. He's here to help me for the rest of my life. Right. Now the same thing is true when we go into meetings, right? You're not going in there to convince them and trick them. You do wanna show your best front and you wanna have your messages that you wanna explain why might you be the best for this project. But you're never gonna to try to trick them. No magical phrase, I'll give you a bunch of phrases, but no magical phrase will ever trick someone and even if you do, you'll get found out later. So you wanna be very clear about who you're targeting. Like with Jackie, she's targeting a very specific type of customer. Mm -hmm. So when you do that, that's why 80% of the work is done before you ever walk in the room. You've already okay. This is good. This yeah. Is, so this is. I, I mean, everyone's hands. There's like everyone's heads are down. <laughs> so number one, who am I going after? It's not everyone. We're using that five minute straight jacket technique, and we're using the pay certainty technique. Okay. Do they have the ability to pay, and do they have the willingness to pay? All right. Most people in our line of work do. There's okay. a lot of. I mean, shooting weddings. I know people that make a million dollars a year shooting weddings. Yep. So there's money there. There's with maternity photography. There's there's money there. With certainly with advertising galleries, right. like high-end fine art, there's a lot of money there. Right. So that doesn't tend to be a problem. Like, Great. Can they pay? They, yes, they can pay. Excellent. So then we've talked about who are they? Do they have the ability and willingness to pay? Great. Now we're going to start generally stereotyping in our head that okay. straight jacket technique. What is their experience? What are they looking for? Then we're going to test it. Okay. Then we're going to go into these meetings and we're going to have scenario planned out every which way that they could do it. Notice, by the way, that what I'm talking about is not taking massive shortcuts. I actually believe to get disproportionate results, you gotta work twice as hard as someone else, but if you work on the right things, you can get five times the results. It's okay. a totally different mindset than most people think. They're like, let me just continue sending out these pitch books, blah, 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 nothing will happen. I'm like, let's do a bunch of work up front, and then if you do it right, this other person is gonna go like this, and you're spending a lot of time here, and all of a sudden you're gonna surpass them. Okay. So you go into these meetings, and now you're using your words, you're using your phrases, you're talking about negotiation, you're talking about why you do extraordinary work, and am I right? I'm not sure, but let me tell you a little bit about what I do and how I might be able to help you. So we talked about the briefcase technique, should we talk oh, about yeah, this? Oh yeah, this is amazing. All right. You can just right now call it the briefcase technique, you should put it in bold face in whatever note device you're taking right now, because this shit blew my mind when he, he told it to me. So and Again, I have to confess, I have been doing this, you know, showing more portfolio for 10 plus years and getting super kick-ass jobs. And I started doing this and it was like, yeah, like a light switch. And Scott, who's helped me do a lot of this work, is on camera A right there, or camera two, I think, um, will, will back me up. Yeah. So it, it's incredibly effective. So this is a simple technique and um, it's generated several millions of dollars. It's laughable how easy it is. It is, it's unbelievable. In fact, people, especially technical people, are really skeptical. Mm -hmm. They're like, this sucks for me, this is so salesy, it doesn't work. And then I'm like, oh really? Boom, 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 boom. 50 testimonials of how it's generated 70% raises and things like that. So let me show you how it works. So you go into a meeting and you're talking to your client or the hiring manager, whoever it may be. And you say, you, ask, you start by asking a lot of questions. So tell me about you know, kind of what you're looking for. And oh, that's interesting. How have you thought about X, Y, Z? And what are the issues you're thinking about? You're just asking great questions. Ask great questions yeah. is, I, I, can't, I cannot under, wait, I can't overstate right. how important that is. Like, for, especially in creative. Because you're getting hired to solve a creative problem. Right, right, right. Okay, so ask a lot of questions. Ask great questions. And then you say, and so they're saying, well, you know, our biggest challenges are X, Y, and Z and we're really confident about ABC, but we're just not sure about this. 
And you say, oh, okay, that's really interesting. So I had a few thoughts. Would it be okay if I share some of them with you? You're asking permission because you want to get their respect. And they say, of course. And you say, well, you know, I actually prepared a couple of things. I wonder if you'd like to see it. And then you literally theatrically go like this. Just, you reach down into your, your portfolio. briefcase or your portfolio or your back, whatever it is. And you say, you know, so there's, there's actually four things that I would think about. Take a look at this. And you say, let me walk you through it. When I look at your website or I look at the project that you've outlined, the first thing I thought was ABC. And at this point, they're like this. They're going, yeah. They, they can't stop nodding and they almost can't stop smiling. And it's happened hundreds of times. Why? Why does this work? Okay. Let's talk about a couple of reasons. The psychology is totally fascinating. First of all, nobody does this. People walk in and they're just like, oh yeah, like they ask stupid questions and then they just try to sell themselves and they believe that a client meeting or an interview or negotiation is about answering questions. Wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. An interview is not about answering questions. It's about telling your story and communicating your main messages. So when people go into a job interview or a, client, a prospect meeting, they, it's not about answering the prospect's questions. Yes, you have to do that, just like you have to be good at your craft, but you have to communicate your message of why. Second, when you pull out your briefcase technique, what it means is, holy shit, this guy has done a ton of work outside this meeting before he got in the room, which automatically separates you from everyone else. Because what do other people do? They just walk in and they answer questions. Third, the things you're writing on this are the exact words that you learned from your research when you talk to the other brides or mothers. Mm -hmm. So they're like- Or art directors or creative directors exactly. or, or art buyers at agencies or photo editors. Exactly. You are literally using their words. So you're, hearing, you're looking at them and that's why they're going like, yeah, yeah, oh my God, he, he knew this before I even said it? Yeah. So you're, you, what you're doing in that case, I'm gonna continue yeah. to like, verbalize yep. using my, my industry's words. You're gonna say that they thought about you know, the client your client might think this is too risky, but here are some ways that you can talk to them exactly. about overcoming the risk or that it's really not risky. It might be more risky to look like everybody else mm -hmm. instead of looking Perfect. like something, something adventurous and forward thinking. Perfect. So when you sit down, uh, I'm, I'm just theorizing now when you sit down with the wedding photographer, it's like when you sit down to show your wedding photo photographs to your friends, like what you want to be able to show is something that is different than the ones that they showed to their that's right. friends. And so that was, that's a goal, yeah. perhaps. So I have a new addition to this that I haven't really shared publicly. I'd like to share it right now. So this is a version two of the briefcase technique, and I've been yeah. testing it, and it works really well. One thing that people love is they love these kind of high notions, like an outline of the things that you're talking about, but they also love to get really tactical. So what I like to do now is to, if it's for a job, in a job interview, I like to do a 30, 60, 90 day plan. What will I do in the first 30 days, 60 days, and 90 days? People look at it and they're like, oh my God, their jaw drops. Now with a creative project, you could say in the first week, I'd wanna do research, mm -hmm. I'd wanna study what other people have done, and, I'd, and my deliverable would be blah, blah, blah. And then in the second week, and in the third week, and in the fourth week, I would deliver the, the pictures to you and we could do a review. What this does for people, especially the art directors and things, totally mitigates their risk because now they have a piece of paper and they're just like, this is it. Like, they look at it and they're like, I can delegate this to this person. I trust him, and it's a done deal. You've moved price to the fifth or 10th concern, and now they have a document. And there's something profound about a document. Rather than just talking about it, it means you've prepared it on paper, and people just, they're blown away. I read a study recently that was, uh, it was a study of, of 10,000 negotiations over 12 years, or mm -hmm. something like, some absurd, gigantor study, and there was one thing in common that produced a successful sale or license or win for the, uh, the purveyor of the goods, and that was one indicator, and that was who did the most talking. Yeah. In all of the most successful negotiations, the prospect or the, the, the potential hirer mm -hmm. did the most talking. So, I mean, 10, we're talking you know, high-end research. I think it was you know, a, a Oxford or MIT, some crazy-ass research yeah. that said that if you can get the other person to do most of the talking and tell them your problems and tell them, like that is, that's the biggest hurdle because it really sends this message that I'm getting from you, which yeah. is that you've been thinking about their problems, not just how do I pitch you my shit, yes. but I understand that I'm solving problems for you. And 
the irony is if you can be crazy ass creative and show them just the most beautiful work and have this sort of head on your shoulders totally. and you don't need to be in there slick you can just you can be humble and say yeah you know i've been uh prior to our meeting i've been really thinking about this a lot and i think you know this this is like positioning it like this i mean i went out and shot some test stuff for yeah. example and you know here's this is your last ad layout and i just put my images love in love that but, but like this is the sort of thing that I'm going for. Now that takes balls or huevos or, or ovaries or whatever we want to talk about here, whatever, whatever uh, um, signifier, but when you actually can say what you think and yeah. believe it deeply in every pore in your body, that comes across so convincingly. Yeah, it does. So let, let's, talk, let's deconstruct that because I think that's so fascinating. Why don't most people uh, spend more time asking questions? I'll tell you why. Because they believe that a prospect meeting or an interview is about answering questions. So they basically walk into a room and they say, I'm here, I'm here. What would you like to ask me? <laughs> Wrong, you already lost because everyone else is doing the exact same thing. They're just waiting. Wrong. You walk in there and you say, I am thrilled to be here. I have been thinking about this all week and I have a bunch of ideas. Actually, I have a bunch of questions if it's okay to ask you, but, uh, but it's your meeting, so love to have you begin. Now, what happens there? You're, you're gonna start leading by asking questions. You're letting them talk and guess what, people, it's so rare in this world that people actually feel understood. So when you ask these three or four or five great questions, they're like, even though you don't even offer a solution, just the fact that you ask the right question, they're like, yeah, this guy gets me. It's an uncanny thing. When someone asks the right questions, you feel like you're understood. And then if you kind of double take it with a briefcase technique or a portfolio technique, done. It's a done deal. <laughs> It's like the, like the one-two punch. Yeah. You go, ka <laughs> All right, cool. Well, let's take two seconds. Uh, I want to go, I don't know which camera's live because the tally lights aren't working very well, but I'm going to go to Scott's camera because I think that's what's happening. So I'm Chase Jarvis. You're here at Chase Jarvis Live. I'm with Ramit Sethi, number one Amazon New York Times bestselling author of this fancy book here, I Will Teach You to Be Rich. And we're talking specifically about how to apply, you're a behavioral psychologist by nature, how to specifically apply those ideas to selling or promoting your own art because we as artists are terrible at this. <laughs> it's a known fact. So go ahead and ask some questions at hashtag CJ Live. Use my Twitter handle at Chase Jarvis or of course you should also be following at Ramit, um, R-A-M-I-T. Uh, so we'll go to the phones in just a second. I'm going to turn to the audience and say at this point we're kind of like 30, 40 minutes in. If you don't have any questions, I'm going to be embarrassed and upset. So. Put your hand in the air and ask a question because there's got to be something very specific. Yes, sir, you went first. Oh, use the mic if you would. Um, a lot of what you're talking about is how to interact with uh, people after you've actually had a sit down with them mm -hmm. and you have touched a little bit on being able to differentiate the market that you're going after. I'm trying to, to um, get a greater understanding where what your thought is on how we as photographers can go after those market segments specifically to be able to maybe stir up those those initial contacts mm -hmm. so how do you get to even get in front of someone that could potentially hire you great question so the typical way i think that photographers do it is they take a bunch of photos and they put it on a website and then they set up twitter and facebook and then they wait where are the people? Where are my multi-thousand dollar clients? Like, where are they? The thing I would suggest is um, I actually prefer going direct. So I like to, my goal when I teach my students to begin kind of freelancing, I tell them they have one goal. In eight weeks, their goal is to get three paying clients. It does not matter what the price is. It doesn't matter if they even offer you an insulting fee, that's fine. Three, why three? Because your first client might be your mom, second one might be your cousin, but the third one's not a fluke. Third one means you've got something going on where three people have paid you. So here's how I do it. I do my initial research. Remember where I went, go out to the market and I kind of ask these questions. And then at the end, hopefully they like me enough, right? I've said a couple things, they like me. And I say, you know, I'm, I'm not ready to do this yet, but I'm probably gonna start doing it in a couple months. Do you think there might be anyone that might be interested in this? Totally low key, I'm not being salesy at all. And if they like you, they'll say, you know what? Yeah, I actually have a couple friends, let me introduce you. Okay, great. Now here's where most people fall down. They just say, okay, thanks a lot, and they go home and wait for that to happen to them. Wrong. Again, you've already lost if you do that. Instead, what I do is I follow up with an email and say, hey, thanks very much for meeting, loved it, and I'm happy to take you out to coffee anytime. You mentioned Allie and Jen, and if you don't mind, I'd love for an introduction. In fact, here's a forwardable email if it helps. 
feel free to forward it or edit it uh, just to make your life easier. So I'm being kind of really helpful and then I'm getting introductions that way. That's one. The second way is, so that's kind of using the referral strategy. The second is to um, become a thought leader. Now this is a bit of a long-term play. So especially people who live in like smaller cities, imagine doing an art critique or even doing a free column for the local paper. Just to, I'm just giving out simple examples or working with the local blogs. This is more of a long-term play because it's kind of like, where are you getting these clients from? It's gonna take you a while. But when you become the photographer who does an analysis every week in the local paper, and you say like, here's how to take a great photo, and here's what most people are doing when they do photos, you instantly become the go-to guy or the go-to woman. So there are two routes that I would do. I like the first, the direct route, going to find people directly, sending those emails and saying, hey, love to take you out to coffee, and then uh, letting, giving them a really soft incentive to kind of share uh, with their friends. That's beautiful, beautiful. I went to the phones. All right. And Focal Matter uh, <laughs> asked this question, which I thought was pretty funny, <laughs> at Focal Matter. Um, I have a nine to five job, so how do I successfully transition um, out of this nine to five job into um, a full time life as a creative? And I wanna take a, sta a stab at this. If yeah, you, I, I wanna hear please. what you have to say, but because uh, this is something I've talked at length about online when I give talks in front of, in front of large audiences because it's a very popular question. And that, the, the answer is, I can't believe this isn't taught in business school because I think it's one of the most important sort of um, like real world techniques that you have mm -hmm. to, like you have to be able to be juggling this over here and then throw this ball up or you have to be juggling this and throw this ball up and go over here and work like mad. Yeah. It sounds very, very strange, but in, in our modern world, if you want something, there is ample time for you to go get it. And if Tim Ferriss was sitting right here, he would remind us to prioritize the things in our lives. And so if you can keep your nine to five happy, actually in the hours of nine to five, my God, there's so much, you know, so much other time. Yeah. And, and transitioning into that means doing all of these things, like you talked about, doing the market research, Again, we're assuming that your pictures kick ass. We're yeah. assuming that your video kicks ass. So if you need to start there with the fundamentals of making your pictures good, then, then definitely start there. But once you have that, that quality, then it's about identifying your target market, the straight jacket technique, preparing, like identifying your clients. Who do you want to do yeah. work with? Like, to me, that's one of the most important things. Is like, do you try, like my, my hit list is like 20 people deep. It's not 200, it's 20. Right. And there are photographers who'll send out a thousand mailers. It's just like no. carpet bombing. You've done something wrong if yeah. you have to do that. Yeah. You've already messed up. Because you're, you're just playing the same game that everyone else is playing. And there's always gonna be someone better with more time, with more money, that can just carpet bomb a larger audience. You've already lost if that's the game you're playing. The game happens, it's almost a game that's being played around you that you can't even see. It's an invisible game of who makes the right decisions before they ever get to that meeting? Right. Who decides who they're gonna target? What are they gonna say? How are they gonna get in their heads? And then when you get there, to, to the outside person, it seems magical. Like, how does Chase get into these meetings and he just closes them left and right? Well, Chase did all the work beforehand. Right, there's and now this when he belief in, that you didn't have to do the work or that somehow, you, you, yeah, that's, that's bullshit for sure. And I think I can say that with basically everyone who I employ. Mm -hmm. There's a very specific story around that. And Norton is a great example. Um, Norton, uh, was living, if I'm not mistaken, in Brazil, and he wanted to come to the U.S. to learn from photographers. And Norton, you should wave to the camera. I think they're going to put you on camera. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Norton moved from Brazil to Florida because he wanted to get closer to the American photography scene. And in Florida, he was acquainted with my work. And he freaking quit everything and moved to Seattle. Not with the prospect of, oh, Chase and I had a conversation. He's probably going to hire me. He's like. Right. If I'm gonna try and get a job from this guy, I gotta be around. Right. Like that's my number one thing. So this is what I'm talking about. I'm saying doing the homework. How many of you all are willing to do that to get a client to get a job? Like that takes those huevos, those ovaries, those balls that we were talking about earlier. To me, that's the homework. Yeah. Right. So I think if you're segwaying, segwaying or segmenting, seg, yeah, segwaying out of your nine to five, you have to do the work. You have to know, you have to be great at your craft and you have to do the work. And at some point, 
you're going to look at, you're going to start earning money, you're going to shoot on the weekends, then you're going to shoot after work, and whether it's that you're shooting the club scene or portraits, you have a photo studio in your garage, and then when you start to have enough money over here, you start to look over here, right. start, that starts being less exciting, and then you take the ball that you were throwing up really high at your job, and you move that over, and you just juggle with these two hands, and you tell your boss to kiss it. <laughs> yeah, you know, for us, when we did our research on people earning money on the side, which has a lot of close analogies to what we're talking about here, that there were two huge barriers. Number one, I don't have an idea. Number two, I don't have enough time. We actually have a, a two hour time clinic on how to save basically, I think it's three to five hours a week. I can send it to your readers if you guys want. Wow. Let me, uh, let me get it put together for my staff. We have a URL actually set up for you guys. Okay. But I'll make sure that they're, they're watching right now. All hey right. guys. So make sure they put the time clinic on there. It's um, time clinic. It's, yeah, it's a time clinic. Okay. I will teach you to be rich.com slash chase. And they'll go there and they can just sign up and we'll send them the time clinic for free. Wow. So I think they'll like that. Hopefully your staff is running around, just started They're staring. like, oh shit, Ramit, not again. <laughs> uh, they'll promise, let's take a picture. This is with the new Polaroid Z340. Boom, take nice. that. Um, going back here for some questions. Let's have it. Come on, put your hand in the air and wave it like you just don't care. If I don't get one, I'm gonna be disappointed. Yep, you know you wanted to ask it, fire away. In a market like Seattle, it's not a huge market. You mentioned about, you know, I don't want to be the guy who does everything, but um, could you talk a little bit how the market and the size of the market depends on that? Because sometimes, you know, if you're in a small market, you kind of have to do more than just, you know, I just can't shoot pictures of whatever it might be. I've got to kind of be a little bit of a jack of all trades in order to have those multiple income streams to make it, and especially in this kind of economy. So, mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about that in the Seattle market, especially how that's how you how you can do that? Yeah, a um, couple things. Uh, certainly, when you start off, it might be the case that you have to do a jack of all trades. But you, unless you want to do that forever, <coughs> then you quickly want to figure out where can I, what's what's the most profitable way and the most enjoyable thing that I can do. So if it's taking pictures of pets, great. So remember that when you find one, two, three, five clients, they all have friends that probably would be interested. So a couple things happen. One, as you start to do all these things, you start to say, which of these is gonna give me kind of the closest to my goals? Like, for example, it might be that taking pictures of brides is highly, highly lucrative, and that's what you want. Your goal is to make money. Okay, great. Or it might be that you want a lifestyle where you can just shoot on the weekends and not during the week, fine. So you find those people, get a couple of those clients, and then you can do a couple things. One is you can ask them for referrals. Who do they know? Soon, you become basically the go-to guy. Now, this doesn't happen overnight, it takes a long time, but for example, when people talk about financial automation, that's, they come to me. So I have been, become known as that guy. Or psychology of money, they come to me. Now, do they come to me for budgets? No, and that's okay. The second thing is to also broaden the vision of thinking about it. So yes, you may be local here in Seattle, but remember that there is a huge amount of work outside of Seattle that you could do. It could be that you do it online, could be that you fly somewhere. There are, there are a variety of different ways. And I understand there are certain particulars about photography. It's tough, especially when you're starting out. But remember that like, for the people that work for me, for example, I haven't met some of them and they've worked for me for over a year. Um, there are other people, especially now, it's crazy, right? Yeah, it's, crazy. it's so cool. So there are a lot of different ways you can do it besides just thinking about working locally. Think broadly, think in a kaleidoscope way and realize that there are tons of people who want awesome photographers with awesome communication skills and all these other skills that most creative people don't think about at all and realize that there are an unlimited number of those people out there. That's beautiful. I'm going to second that. The, the fact that I live in Seattle is an anomaly to the most, most of my peers. Like, wow, how do you do that? I do spend a lot of time in New York, you know, months at a time. Um, we have lived in Paris. Um, the idea, however, is that I have projected a global image. I do travel a lot, but I, that, that has to do with picking the people that I want to work with more than anything in the world mm -hmm. and targeting them regardless of geography. Who do my skills match up with? And not being afraid to say that and to let them know that, that this is what I want to solve this particular problem for you. I'm a great match with your need and being able to prove it to the briefcase technique through other work that I've done, et cetera. So it is a global economy now. I mean, we're taking questions right now from 
all over the world. So if that had any, if, if anyone was doubting if it's a global economy, that should just the, the example of sitting here in this room should remind us that it is. Um, but specifically, like have the the huevos to think larger than Seattle. Ten percent of my work comes from this city. Ten oh. percent, and I have called this place home for the duration of my professional career. So I think that there's something to to think about that goes beyond geography. Um, I don't know, we're, I, I'm, I'm sort of losing my train of thought, yeah. but I'm going to go back to the phones if I can. I don't know if we felt like we, we got to what you were after. Um, hey, Norton, will you grab that other, uh, you had another great question that came in through some, I'm not able to keep up with the feed because it's going so fast. Um, Ambient Magic asks, if you have quality content and decent web traffic, how do you turn those views into sales? Ah. So, so this is, yeah, hang on just one second, Norton. This, this is a really interesting question because mostly, now, it has to do very much with what kind of photography you're into because people that check out my, my site, I don't necessarily try and convert them. It's, it's not really a conversion thing where I get them in there and I move them through the marketing funnel and, and then I get a sale. <laughs> um, I think it, it could be more like that in a portrait or a maternity or a yeah. wedding sort of an environment. But what I try and project is, is great pictures. And I keep them coming back by doing really, really interesting personal projects. So this also is, this is like doing your homework. Right. It's, the, it's very analogous, except the homework that I'm doing is super creative shit that I know that they want. And that has to do with the straitjacket. I think about, boy, what's going to get them? It's going to be something they haven't seen before. So I'm out there trying to do things that people haven't seen before. And I've cited a number of examples. Songs, Reading, and Drinking is a great example of a project that I did that had no financial benefit. In fact, I paid a lot of money to make it happen. Mm -hmm. That people, art directors, are constantly thinking about, oh, man, I want to be around rock stars and be in cool pictures and having dinner with these with 40 really fascinating people. Right. And the pictures that come out of that are amazing. So it's another sense of actually doing homework. When they come to your site, in the photography world, it's less of a turnkey, click here, here are my rates. Mm -hmm. it, can, it can be. Again, I'm, not trying, I'm trying to speak broadly, but it's, I feel like it's getting them to understand that over and over, you are their solution. When you start to think about who is coming to your site, or you can find out who's coming to your site, you proactively go to them with a meeting and you say, I can tell you've been on my site, or I've started marketing to you. I don't know if you've seen my site lately. I've got these new projects. I want to talk to you about them. So it's a very, very proactive deciding who you want to work with and going after them fact, rather than, this is the, what he just described, or she, Ambient Magic, just described, is the, I made some good stuff, and now I'm sitting back and waiting. Right, right. Well, they're waiting because it's a classic thing that we do. Again, they're waiting for someone to recognize their brilliance instead of going out there and understanding right. what people want. People don't just want the picture. In fact, there's probably a hundred other photographers who could do that same photo. They want the story. They want the narrative. They want the communication. They want, all, they want their problems solved. Yep. So you got to understand, first of all, what are those problems that they want solved? Articulate it, put on your website, and if you want, you know, there's a bunch of tactics we can talk about. You can create t shirts or you can sell prints or whatever, but remember that you have to communicate that story to them. Mm -hmm. And one, one other tactic I'll share, probably the biggest business mistake I made, I mentioned this earlier, wow. was this is the biggest business mistake the business guru has made not starting an email list early enough. So, my email list is my crown jewel. These are the people that signed up. They love me enough to open my emails, and I only send them great stuff. So guess what? If you had all these people come to your site every day, so mention right. that they have decent traffic. Let's say you get 20 people a day to sign up, or at one point 100, 200. That's a lot. You don't have to sell them anything. You just, hey, I'm working on this project. Hey, I'm going to be out in Seattle. Would love to do a meetup with you guys. And one day, when you have a project that you want to sell, or you say, I have some open time, and I'm taking a couple of commissions right now. Guess what? 5,000 people just received that email. Do you think you're going to get one or two? Sales from that? Of course. So starting an email list, it's really simple. There's tons of tools out there. I use Aweber. You can use whatever you want. Uh, these people want to listen to you. Send them great stuff. Nurture the relationship. And by the time you go to ask for something, they will love you so much that they'll be happy to do it. Beautiful. Another question from the Twittersphere. This is from Nicole Notes. What if my husband is the photographer and I'm the communicator? How can we briefcase how can we work the briefcase scenario together now? So what I'm thinking is, like she's the salesperson in the arrangement, not necessarily the, the inner family, the, that they sell together. So he's the photographer, they go out, she sells the thing. In my opinion, you should chime in on this, but the creative needs to do this, the, the presentation. So 
the, the business folk, like I have a business manager, Gerard, he's in the house right there back with headphones on, what, what, buddy? Um, and in the case where I, we get called in on, on a really cool project, I have a vision going in. Mm -hmm. And the briefcase technique I learned from you, I, it's not literally sometimes a briefcase, it's, it's actually just being able to articulate the right. vision that you have for the client. So Gerard makes the meeting, shows up the meeting, and as soon as he gets there, it's like, okay, I'm communicating with the client, and it's like, I wanna present Chase. Chase is here to talk to you a little bit about the work. You know, and it's always very gracious, and having some social gratitude and some, some not, without being slick and cheesy yep. is, is helpful. But I proceed to lay out my vision. You know, after we've asked all the questions, after we've done the stuff that you talked about, getting the other folks to, to say what their problems are, and you say, great, well, I've, you know, I've heard what you said and I actually prepared something and then I will lay that out. And the, I think it's the, the creative that needs to do that because that's where the vision is coming from. And then that's when it kick, you kick it back to your uh, communicator, in this case, the wife, if I'm not mistaken. And then the wife will be like, okay, cool. I hope that, you know, I hope that resonates with you. We'll follow up this meeting and you know, then she'll sort of close the meeting, a lot of handshakes and gratitude and then good follow up is really, really important. Yep. So you have anything to comment about uh, that? Just a couple things I wanna hook your audience up with. Um, I, first of all, I agree, it's funny that sometimes people believe that they don't have enough time to learn the marketing part of it. Mm -hmm. So I knew this restaurant owner near me, I wrote most of my book at this like coffee shop and I mentioned to him one day, hey, what about marketing this and that because I became friends with him and he said, yeah, yeah, I know I really should do that. I don't have time to do it and his restaurant shut down not long after. So I agree that you always, if you're the creative person, you, wanna, you need to take the time to be able to articulate your vision. Otherwise, it just looks like you're delegating it off to someone else, mm. and you're just the technician. That's not a role you wanna be in. That's a great idea. Like, let's say that again. You do not wanna be the technician. You wanna be the vision. Yeah, that's right. A technician is a commodity, like salt. Do I care if I have one brand of salt or another brand? No, fuck no, they're the same to me. One dollar, I don't care, it's a, they're a commodity. Someone who has a vision, someone who has a narrative, a story, and can walk in and show me why it's right for me, price out the door, and I want you, I wanna work with you. You do not wanna be a commodity, you wanna be like a visionary. You do not wanna be a commodity, you wanna be the one who has the vision. Because that's ultimately what they're buying, right? They're not buying a finger presser button person. Yeah. They're not buying a monkey with a finger. They're buying someone who's going to bring vision. So if you cannot use the English language or the French language or the Spanish language or whatever language you're working in, because I know we've got uh, you know, people from all over the globe watching right now, whatever language you're using to articulate your vision, you have to be skilled at that. Let me, let me do another thing for your readers. We have some interview teardowns I recently did so we took people. This is like value day for us. Well, I, wanna, I, <laughs> Thank you so I just much. realized we have all these videos and I want to hook them up. So we, we brought these people in and they actually did an interview with me. And I was like, I pretended to be a pretty tough guy. And they gave me their interview. And then I said, all right, here's how you can take it from 85% to 99%. So I actually showed them the phrases to use, including how to negotiate their salary. So let me send some of those to your, your students as well. Can you give us some examples right now? Or would that yeah. Be, would that would be no, no, difficult no, no, no. To... Let's, let's do it. So for what, example. Then, so what we're going to say right now is specific wording yeah. to help you increase the value of your work. Is yeah, that right? That's right. Okay. And then we'll share these also on IWillTeachYouToBeRich.com slash chase. So if you go there, we'll give you these videos and you can see the before and afters. It's so awesome. You have to see them. So for example, there's something we call a competence trigger and it's basically what, what uh, really competent people do. For example, I mentioned the bar example. If I yep. walk in and I'm just looking around like this, that's a low competence trigger. It's clear that I'm kind of like a low status guy, <laughs> right? If I walk in, yeah, like, come on, please. <laughs> if I walk in and I'm just confident, cool, I'm having a good time with my buddies, that's a high competence trigger because people with high competence do that. So it kind of signals everyone else, like, oh, this guy probably knows what he's talking about. Let me give you an example when you walk into a job interview mm -hmm. or a prospect interview. A lot of times, and, and I should say that that I get like once I'm up for a job, they w they will interview several creatives. There'll be four creatives on the not necessarily on the phone at one time, mm -hmm. but they'll have calls with the two or three people. You have to turn in an estimate, which is how much you do the job for. You have to turn in sometimes a treatment, and then they're going to get on the phone with you. So this happens at the highest end of, of advertising photography. You get yep. to, you do this. It's literally like an interview. So so let's talk about. I wanna give you a scenario that happens in job interviews and then we can apply it to photography. Okay. So in job interviews, one, one thing that they'll try to do is they'll try to say, okay, 
so what's your rate or how much, um, what's your ex expectation of salary? Now, what a low quality person will do is they'll be like, oh, well, I made 35,000 at my last job and I'm hoping to make 37. Wrong. What they, what they already thought is this is a low status performer and I'm gonna basically give them 36 and we're done. Even though they have a budget for 60. Okay, you just F yourself. On the other hand, a high status performer goes like this. They go, oh, you know what? Well, we can discuss salary later. I'm more than happy to discuss it. Right now, I just wanna see if it's a good fit for both of us. So what are we doing there? We're deferring salary until later. And right now, we're just seeing if it's a good fit for both of us. What's the key there? It's not just you deciding if you wanna work with me. I'm actually deciding if I wanna work with you. It's a back and forth. And so let's try to apply that to photography now. When you I already did it in my head, but I'm sure you, you should actually do it because it's, it, it's what goes on in the high level communication conversations that you're talking about right now. So walk yeah. us through it, go ahead. The, the, the meta message is so important. When you walk into a room, you are not walking in as a desperate beggar, even if you really want this client. Counterintuitively, if you really want this client, you want to explain to them that you have many options. Not in a sort of derogatory manner. Not at all. Yeah, it's yeah. very important. This yeah. is a subtle hit here. You, you have to just be confident that you're good enough that you will get other clients. There are other people knocking on the door, even if you haven't heard the knock yet. Mm -hmm. So you walk in and, and in language and in the way you communicate, you're saying, you know, let's just see if it's a good fit right now. We can deal with the details later, but right now I just want to see if it's a good fit for both of us. Why? Because you are selecting them as much as they're selecting you. Now, it's funny, when I say this, People, either they're like, yeah, 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 or they're like, Ramit, that doesn't work until you're making $25,000 a sale or whatever. Well, it does. Your message starts with the way you communicate. Even if you don't have other options, you wanna let them know that you are a discerning photographer. You're not just a desperate photographer, you're actually discerning. When you do that, they actually like you more. The first job, the first rate that I was ever hired for to shoot new material was uh -huh. thousands of dollars per day, and I was, I, I did that before I'd ever shot editorially at all. Mm -hmm. This is a, like a total confession here on, on the old internet. So Love but, it. And it was exactly that. Like I had decided that I wasn't gonna take a shit job just to get a job. Right. At that point I was waiting tables. I was doing work that needed to be done to pay the bills. On one side this is the transition from nine to five. But even my very first uh, commission was more than I had made the previous year because it was several wow. days at several thousand, several thousand dollars a day. And I basically just had used exactly that technique without knowing what it was called or right. what the hell I was doing. But, and it was very, very effective. And the thing is, is that I actually meant it. Right. And they can tell. Yeah. People are pretty sophisticated at those levels. Right. And, and so saying these words and meaning what you say is, is are different things. You know, another thing that, that uh, I want to recommend that your viewers and everybody here do is build a pipeline. So too often we get this thing one-itis. So when it comes to men and women, we pick someone and we're like obsessed with them. Like, oh, I hope they return my text. Oh, please, like they haven't returned in three days. What does it mean? Well, when you have one prospect that you're hoping and counting on, you can actually turn into like, you get a little desperate and you walk into the room and it, you actually telegraph it. Even though you don't say it. She's here. Yeah, they can tell, they can tell. <laughs> right. But what if you had a pipeline of five or 10 or 15 people that you had coffee meetings with, right? And you've been doing all this behind the scenes. So when you walk in, you actually know, you know what, if I lose this deal, that's okay. I have 14 other people that I'm talking to in the next two weeks. So how do you get those things? Let's also do another thing for my staff watching. Let's give some scripts that we use to get meetings with people. I wanna include some email scripts that we actually use wow. and we tested with thousands of people. So you send these out and they will actually get you meetings, coffee meetings, where you can actually basically get to know people. So another thing we'll put in the, the vault for your for your uh, Screw Chase Jarvis. Jarvis. Com slash blog. It's all about, <laughs> I, will, <laughs> I will get you to be rich, or I will teach I will you to teach be you rich, rich. And slash Chase. Slash okay. Chase, yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll put those email scripts up uh, later today, tomorrow. Okay. And hook your readers up. Beautiful, God. So I, I like the idea though that you have to believe, you have to have conviction. And if you lose the one-itis, yeah and you have a lot of prospects in the pipeline, I think that should give you confidence necessary to, uh, to act and behave the way that I think is gonna send the right mojo. Yeah. Another great question came in from Iris Eben, says, Chase, describe your first gig you landed as a photographer and pitch you absolutely bombed at. What did you learn from each? So the first gig that I got um, I'm probably not at liberty to talk about the, you know, there's just so many contractual things about who it was, but it was a, 
It was this you know, large billion plus dollar company and it is something that I had done exactly what you're talking about, which is develop a relationship with them over time through finding out who the decision makers are, doing the homework, mm -hmm. sitting down and having coffee, and I made it known that I was a photographer to this person through um, a set of a numbers of, of, I think, unique correspondence via email or, or send, I send in a cool um, thing, my equivalent of a portfolio, but it was a, it was a cool um, package. And at, I was able to, when I was able to get a meeting, there was an element of timing that I wasn't aware of that worked really good, and that's where being prepared and where, where luck is, right? Yeah. Being prepared at the right time um, fell into my lap. And when the negotiations for, I didn't have an agent at the time, I didn't have a producer, I didn't have anything, it was just me, so I was the one doing the negotiation. Mm -hmm. We went away and I went home and I read a lot about negotiation and then we came back to the table and used a lot of these techniques. And, and I decided that coming in at, at no, at a, at a very, very low rate, I've never seen a photographer who came in at a low rate suddenly get paid a high rate. You will get sold the idea that this is how much money I have right now. If you just come in and do this, I will, you know, you'll get more later. That's not what happens. Because if you come in at $1,000, when they get $50,000, do you think they're going to go, my $1,000 person is going to be a great $50,000 photographer? Okay. Hell no. Right. So I didn't want that to happen to me. So I went in as a high-priced option. And I actually didn't believe that I was going to get the job because I was going to be too high-priced. The irony is that when they said, Okay, that sounds good. Um, send us, you know, we'll send you a PO, and you know, you can send us the contract. I just in my head went, oh shit, I should ask for twice as much. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and and that that in and of itself is a whole you know, another, another conversation. You want to be that, wow, boy, what I see here is so great. I'm just gonna have to go back to my budget and right. get a little bit more, and then then we're gonna do the deal. That's ideally, but then the person feels like they you feel like you went on a limb and they feel like they went on a limb and there's a lot of charged energy in the project and I think that's really positive. It can also be negative if you, if you push that too far, so I would encourage that. But, uh, so that's an example of projecting the, the success that you want to have. And I was literally ready to walk away because I didn't want to, if I did 100 shitty jobs at $50 to get to a $5,000 rate, then I could just do one. $5,000 rate, and then I would be thought of as that particular person from then on. And this is, you know, more than a decade ago. So you start to do, you know, the thinking about how that has played out for my particular career. Right. Um, and then where I've totally bombed, I, we, there's not enough time <laughs> in the show today to discuss all the times that I've bombed, but there, there have been plenty. And the bombing usually is being unprepared or believing, like, not being able to believe the message that you're giving that you're a good match. You know, mm -hmm. like you look at the bank accounts getting a little low. Yeah, I'd love to shoot dog food. That sounds awesome. I'm a good <laughs> dog food photographer. And then you can just sort of smell it in the air that, it's, that you're not good. So I did one where I totally bombed. I still remember it. I went into, I was like doing some consulting work. It was like $20 an hour. I was in college, which was a lot of money to me back mm -hmm. then. And I was like, you know what? I've been here for eight months. I should get a raise. And so I go into the meeting and the guy's like, okay, what do you want? And I'm like, you know, I was like, well, you know, I've been here quite a bit and I really understand the process and I'd like to discuss a raise. And he goes, why should we give you a raise? And I go, well, I've been here a long time and I understand the process. I literally just repeated what I just said. Right. And I've been doing my, exactly what I should have. For exactly. The rate for I'm eight months. So shouldn't you pay me more because I've been here a long time? And the guy just went, no. And I, and I had never planned out or scenario planned what to say if he said no. Like there are these fallbacks you can do if someone says no. And so he just basically politely sent, sent me out of his office and I was like, at first I was angry at him and then it took me about a day to calm down and I realized it was totally my fault. I gave him no reason to give me a raise. I gave him nothing compelling and I didn't talk about him, I talked about me. That was the last time I ever did that. And now what does it sound like when Ramit wants a raise? It's totally different. So I go in and I, I say, you know, first of all, it's like a multi-month process. So I'll go in there and I'll say, and this is what I tell my students to do. They often get like 70% raises. That's fucking high. <laughs> That's so insane. It's crazy. Don't, get, don't get any ideas. <laughs> <laughs> so they'll go in and they'll say, they'll say, you know, um, first of all, uh, Mike, let's say their boss's name is Mike. Mike, uh, listen, for the last six months, I've been doing these three things. And we sat down and discussed this six months ago. And I've done this. I've knocked it off the plate. This I've knocked it out of the park. This one I'm still working on. So I'd like your guidance. 
I'd also like a little help. I really want to be an extraordinary performer. So can you give me some guidance on what you'd like me to do in order to do that three months from now? And at that time, I'd like to come back. I'd also like to discuss some, some compensation adjustments. But first, I just want to focus on being an extraordinary performer. So notice a couple things. One, I'm talking about what I've already done well. So I'm walking in there with a positive attitude. I did this, attitude. this, and this, right? Exactly. So they're like, oh, I love this. Two, I'm asking them for advice. Everyone loves to give advice, right? right. I'm not asking That's them for That's the only money. reason I have this show. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm saying, what should I do going forward? Not to make more money, but to be an extraordinary performer. Then when I walk in the door to discuss salary, which is two, three months later, 80% mm -hmm. of the work's done. I'm like, we discussed this. We discussed being a top performer. Here's what I've done. Here's what I find as the comps on salary.com or payscale.com. I'd like to discuss a compensation adjustment. Not, a, I not, not I want you to give me more money because it feels like I'm taking it out of your pocket. I like to discuss an adjustment. Here's the phrase you use. I like to discuss a number that's fair for both of us. Who can argue with that? It's hard fair. To, right, it's hard to argue. Exactly. So that's your, that's your process in general for how you were talking about getting a raise. My brain's starting to be scrambled. There's a lot of stuff that we're, like, this is just like rapid fire stuff coming out of the, out of the pipe that are, hopefully is gonna be incredibly useful for you folks at home. Um, to the folks here in the live studio audience, I'm gonna go to the question and answer now here as well. Raise your hand if you've got a question for Ramit, or, or me of course, uh, because it's time for you guys to answer it. I'm gonna stick my head down here and, and, and pull out the next Perfect. one. But right up front, you've, it sounds like you, you've, I saw you raise your hand earlier, now you've got it raised a little higher <laughs> Drop the knowledge. What do we need to know? Uh, right here in front, Norton. So my head's kind of swimming right now. Um, and I understand the importance of saying what you're worth or just putting it out that number. Um, what I'm struggling with is figuring out what number should that be for me and how can I feel comfortable and confident with that number and not kind of squeamish. Right. So yeah. I guess, you know, this is so, more so on the emotional side of things. This is, I think that I'm probably gonna make a bunch of really categorical mistakes with, I wanna answer this because this is how I've approached yeah. it. And I think it's been somewhat successful, but it's, I've also, I'm surely breaking some classic rules. <laughs> so you're gonna tell me what rules I've broken and how to do better. But the way that I approach this and the way I have for my whole career is, what I need to find out is how much money is on the other end of the pipeline, not necessarily what my rate is. Now, there's all kinds of coaching and stuff that, that the, the American Society of Media Photographers, the ASMP, will teach you, and you should know that number, what it takes to make a profitable business, because you should not be doing business for less than profitable, right? Because then, at the end of the year, you're gonna be, you know, you're gonna be screwed. So, you need to know what that number is, but don't, necessarily just plug in the number and have that be what your day rate or your whatever is. I like to approach it and the people like my agents and my managers that like the, there's an understanding of what's in the budget and there's and and when you get to a place where you have proven that you've done you've pulled the briefcase out you know that you're the right match or they said we've been watching you for six months we know that you're the perfect person for this campaign what people on my staff and my team do is they, I, okay, they ask, like, what's the budget? And I think that, again, I have priced myself as a premium project or product, and I hope that the, the world knows that. And there's sometimes there's not the money. So just cutting through the bullshit and saying, I'm happy to estimate this, I need to understand, you know, in, in round terms what the budget is to make sure we're a good match because that's, you know, you can tell sort of how the contact comes to you, what, you know, if it came out of, uh, off a reader board or something at the local coffee okay. shop, you kind of know their budget versus if it came in through your agent. So again, this is, this is a skill that is hard to impart in just a single question, but understanding and finding a good rhetoric to, dis to discover the budget. And usually when the budget comes back, it's, I would say, it's not always insufficient, but you can say, okay, um, I always reserve the right to go away and think about it. Like get, some, get a piece of information and go think about it and find out what it is that you're, how you can frame whether or not this works for you. So then we go back and say, well, you know, we did the math, I did the math. Like my producer crunched, my producer crunched a, a, an estimate. We looked at, and there's just not enough money for the creative fees and the usage in this particular budget. Here, and I don't just end there, I say here are three ways we, ways we can change that. One, we can 
shoot for less days because that means less production fees and then the usage is more in line with what tradition is. Two, we can reduce the deliverables. So there's less final images that, you know, I, and, and without going to the details, I will give, I will provide three ways that we can actually work together. Unless there's not enough money. And then I don't say, oh shit, I'll just do it for that. Anytime you're, negotiation, you're negotiating, don't take don't take deliverables off the table for the same money, or don't, don't leave deliverables on the table for the same money. If it's, it's like, okay, it, it should be $20,000, it's $10,000, okay, I'll do the same work. Right. I won't do the post-production, or I'll only shoot for one day instead of two days. I, like, you have to take things off because you, the first number that you said has a value associated with it. And if you all of a sudden just say, oh, okay, I'll do it, then you realize that that value, the number that you threw out there was bullshit. And bullshit doesn't sell. How, did I, how am I blowing this? No, it's awesome. Uh, I think um, the taking things off the table mm -hmm. just serves to make you more authentic. Because if you said 20K and then all of a sudden you're like, okay, 10K, then it's clear you were bullshitting them. But if you say, look, I just can't do it, but I can give you X, Y, Z, you're also solving their problems. I think one of the things that I advise my, my photography students to do early on when they're just starting to get clients is that in general, I don't really care about the money for the first three. It's even okay, I know this is kind of like it's unusual to hear in the creative world. I don't even care if they're dramatically underpricing themselves for the first three clients. All I care about is that they can get three clients because getting someone to pay 20 bucks an hour or 50 bucks an hour or $1,000, a small fee is great for confidence. That's really important. Second, I try to use each of these clients in a strategic way. So we were talking about how testimonials are strategic. So remember when you do your research and you find out these phrases people want, like, I want my son to get into Harvard? Well, guess what happens? When you do an amazing project for your first three clients, you say, hey, listen, if I do an extraordinary job, will you agree to give me a written testimonial? And they're gonna be like, of course. And then you either write the testimonial for them and ask them if they're comfortable with it, they can change it. Or you say, would you be willing to write it? And I'm hoping you can cover how I helped your son get into Harvard, whatever it is. And they write that and in every subsequent interview pitch you do, you have those testimonials. That's worth way more than the money you would have gotten right there. So I always want to try to think about the long-term game. And those first three clients, they're not going to pay you that much anyway, but they can be worth way more to you in other ways besides money. That's how I think about it. Boom, nailed it. All right. So that, I think, was a super badass answer. One of the things we also promised to talk about, which we're getting down, we're, we're inside of 10 minutes now, so I'm going to need to, uh, I need to start moving us toward the finish line here. So I'm going to be taking a couple of your pictures. I, I will shoot with All the right. uh, 600 SE and the new Polaroid Z340 after the show. But between now and then, what uh, I need to get to is working for free. Yeah. It's, yeah. It is a hot topic in our line of work because people always talk about undercutting and being bullshit and bringing the industry down. And, and I have worked for free um, on a handful of occasions that I thought were really usually where there's a beneficiary that it's a nonprofit or like th mm -hmm. there's a, a, a lot of reasons and you wanted to talk about that so yeah. open it up baby. So I don't, I don't know if we actually agree or not on this because we didn't cover it together but I'll just share what I think. I worked for free a lot. It helped me get my career to a place that I could not have gotten it to otherwise. Now anytime you talk about free or spec work for some reason there's like this brigade of anti-free people who just come out and they just like post 6,000 comments on it, like, free is ruining the industry. And I'm like, you guys, you can say that, but you don't get to determine the market. The market does. So here's how I look at it. I know a lot of us have been burned by working for free because we go on Craigslist and there's some company that's like, work for us for free and if you do a good job, we'll give you a million dollars later. And it's like, clearly this is bullshit. However, free can be strategic. So I work for free, for example, obviously if it's a good cause, I'll give a speech for free or something like sure. that. But um, free can be strategic if you find someone that you trust, okay, that you know is going to give you something. When you're working for free, you're always going to get something. It could be a portfolio piece. Mm -hmm. It could be a testimonial, which is very important for you. Uh, it could be a referral to three other people. So I always go in and I say, look, and this is where you teach them to revere you. I don't go in and I'm like, I'll do it for free. Fuck it. No, I say, <laughs> look, my normal rate is Can we get an applause? That's just beautiful <laughs> right there. You don't do that. You don't do that. Okay. So I would go in for, let's say, a consulting thing. And I would okay. say, look, my normal rate is $2,000 an hour. And normally I charge that and I don't do discounts. But you know what? I really, actually, let me pick a different number. My normal consulting rate is $50 an hour. Okay. But, and I don't do discounts, but I really like your project. I really think it has a lot of potential. 
I'm willing to work for you for free, but we have to agree on a couple things. One, if I do an extraordinary job, then at the end of 30 days, we'll discuss going back to my normal rate. Uh -huh. And two, if I also do an extraordinary job, you agree to refer me to three people that you know. So what does this do? First of all, it establishes your value. This is how much I normally charge. I'm willing to do it for free, but only if you agree to X, Y, Z. Two, you're only agreeing to these things if I do an amazing job. So that's one thing. The second thing is remember that free can be not just about uh, like getting a testimonial, it can be about building your, the things that you need right now. A lot of my photography students, they don't have a portfolio, they don't know, have any testimonials, so they use free strategically. The worst thing to do is just to do it for free with no end game and praying that they'll pay you later. Not gonna happen. Never do that. Not gonna happen. That's horrible. Yeah. Also thinking that you're gonna jump from that position to some super high position, no. like that, that, that uh, million dollar example that you gave. Yeah. That's, just, that's just head in the sand living. Yep. That's just horrible. I, I believe very much about saying, I'm gonna do this because it benefits this particular thing. And if you can find a third party beneficiary that's a nonprofit and you can do great work. Yep. Another thing that you can talk about is creative freedom. Yeah, like, nice. I can do this project, but like, you're hiring me without paying me for my vision, not to micromanage me, not to, so that what you get out of this thing is an amazing piece that looks like you want it to. That is a big thing because as soon as you start doing this for money, there, you, you really end up compromising a lot and that's just the nature of, of work, right? There's a lot of people involved, there's a lot of money involved, there's a lot of opinions. It just gets sort of chopped down a little mm -hmm. bit. The idea that I just walk on set and everyone's like, whatever Chase says is perfect. Right. You know, it's not happening. That's not how it works? It's not how it works, no, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, we're winding down. Uh, I'll take a couple questions. We are gonna have a little extended session here for the in-studio audience, but I wanna give away uh, two of your books and a signed Polaroid. I've been shooting Polaroids here, as you know, throughout the course look of the day. That. Wow. Yeah, good looking. You look a lot better. I look like <laughs> Casper the Ghost, and you look like you just got back from a sweet Tahitian vacation. There we go. <laughs> um, so I wanna give away book winners. At Fuza, F-E-U-Z-A, you don't wanna be the technician, you wanna be the vision. That's beautiful. You get a signed nice. book from Ramit. Nice. Email contest at chasejarvis.com to uh, give us your information so we can send that. Also, Juan Carlos H., when you can hit on what they want, hope for, and dream, price is a mere triviality. Love that one. That's another signed book from Ramit, the I Will Teach You To Be Rich book. And the winner of the signed Polaroid is Drongo Photo. Teach them to review, sorry, <laughs> teach them to revere what you've done. Awesome. All amazing quotes. Great. Thank you folks at home for tweeting out all the, uh, the great information that I'm um, pulling out of, of Ramit here. The question and answer has been great. Um, I'm, I'm again very thankful to, to the folks that have been supporting us, to Polaroid, to B&H, to all of you folks out there who have been spreading the good love for Chase Jarvis Live. This is our closing episode for the 2011 season. When you see what's in store for 2012, you're gonna pull your hair out with joy, I hope. Um, I can't thank you enough to, uh, for, for what you've done for flying here all the way from New York to sit here with, for 90 minutes and answer the world's questions. It's been a huge treat. Um, what am I forgetting, team? I, I know I'm forgetting something. Do we have time? How much time? We have three minutes. Is it time for one more question? Now let's shut her down. We'll take questions from these guys. Beautiful. Thank you so much. It's been a huge pleasure. Internet, I love you. Thank you, guys. I love you. I'm so grateful. He's at Ramit, A at the, that little A sign, R-A-M-I-T. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Sati, thank you so much. My pleasure. I'm at Chase Jarvis, and gosh, that's all there is. Just, again, <laughs> huge thanks to Polaroid and B&H for supporting what we're doing. Mad respect. The new, the new Polaroid up here, I got the 600. I'm going to be shooting your portrait within a second. Awesome. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Round of applause if we can for this man right here. <laughs> Thank, you guys. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. That was awesome. The new, the new to the old, the old to the new, the new to the old.